Welcome to the world of the Beverly Hillbillies, a classic TV series that started in 1962. It's the story of a family from the hills who stumble upon oil and become rich overnight. They move to Beverly Hills and their simple country ways clash with the fancy city lifestyle. It's full of laughs and surprises and sometimes it tugs at your heartstrings. Now, let's talk about the stars of the show. There were many talented actors, but one that stood out was Buddy Ebsen as Jed Clampett. He brought a warmth and humor to the character that made you feel like he was part of your own family. As for when I first watched it, well, I don't watch TV. But I know that for many, this show has been a beloved part of their lives since it first aired. What about you? Do you remember the first time you saw the Beverly Hillbillies? Maybe it was with family or friends, and it brings back good memories. We'd love to hear your stories and memories in the comments below. Keep watching for more fun facts and stories about this unforgettable show. The Beverly Hillbillies, a classic television series, humorously depicted the life of the Clampett family after striking oil and becoming wealthy. Jed Clampett, the patriarch, moved his family from their rural home to a mansion in Beverly Hills, yet they retained their down-to-earth values. Jed, portrayed by Buddy Epson, was the sensible core of the family, guiding them through the challenges of their new lifestyle. His daughter, Ellie Mae, played by Donna Douglas, was known for her affinity for woodland animals and her striking appearance. Jethro Bodine, Jed's nephew, may not have been the sharpest tool in the shed, but his physical strength was undeniable. Granny, the matriarch, often found herself at odds with modern conveniences, adding to the show's humor. Their wealthy neighbors, the Drysdales, had a complex relationship with the Clampets. Anchor Mr. Drysdale, responsible for managing the Clampet fortune, was always keen to keep them satisfied, while his wife, Mistress Drysdale, could hardly conceal her disdain for their unsophisticated ways. Despite the weekly chaos, the show shone a light on the Clampets' unpretentious and genuine approach to life often contrasting it with the materialistic world around them. The Beverly Hillbillies remains a beloved example of comedy that brings out the humor and cultural contrasts. Did you cut a fork for that new store-bought slingshot she brought? Did she bring you a slingshot? On a Wednesday evening in late September 1962, a new television show made its debut, capturing the attention of viewers across the United States. It aired on CBS, establishing itself in a primetime slot and quickly became a favorite, running successfully for several years. The show's schedule shifted over time, moving from its initial 900 p.m. Eastern Standard Time slot to an earlier time in its final year. In recognition of their musical achievements, the Sons of the Pioneers, a group associated with one of the show's actors, received a prestigious honor on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Their star can be found on Hollywood Boulevard, marking their contribution to the recording industry. Among the cast, Donna Douglas shared more than just screen time with her co-star Buddy Epsonator. Both were not only actors, but also gospel singers, and they shared similar political views aligning with the Republican Party. Their common interests extended beyond the set, reflecting a harmony in their professional and personal lives. I did Jed. <sighs> Doctor says it ain't good for him to get excited. <laughs> In the fabric of classic television, family ties often take a twist. This was evident in the relationship dynamics within the Clampett family, where Jed and Pearl, being first cousins, had a unique family structure. Jethro, Pearl's son, referred to Jed as Uncle Jed, despite being first cousins once removed. Similarly, Ellie Mae, Jed's daughter, called Pearl Aunt Pearl, reflecting the close-knit bond they shared. Behind the scenes, life imitated art as Buddy Epson, who played Jed had a long-standing friendship with Max Bear Jr., known as Jethro. Their connection predated the show, rooted in Epson's acquaintance with Bear's father, a renowned boxer whom he met at a boxing event. The show also played with the cultural stereotypes of the time, particularly through Ellie May's romantic interest Dash Riprock. His character was a humorous take on the heartthrob actors of the era, embodying the attractive yet not so bright male stereotype. In a playful nod to this trope, Jethro once adopted the moniker Beef Jerky, adding a layer of humor to his character's persona. These elements contributed to the show's charm, reflecting the social commentary and relationships of the time. Calling for swimming right here. And Ellie's out swimming right now. She didn't jump in with her clothes on, did she? In the heart of Bel Air, the grand residence that served as the fictional home to the Clampett family was none other than the Kirkaby Mansion. 
This property, a symbol of the show's success, was put on the market in 27, carrying a price tag of 30 million. The catchy tune that viewers came to associate with the opening credits, performed by Jerry Scoggins, achieved significant popularity, landing at number 44 on the music charts. Interestingly, in the show's closing credits, Jerry Scoggins is credited as Jethro Scoggins. A notable aspect of the series is the availability of its initial episodes to the public, specifically the entirety of the first season and the initial 19 episodes of the second season are not protected by copyright, allowing them to be distributed widely on various home video formats and DVDs by numerous companies. However, due to copyright restrictions, these releases often feature alternative music in place of the original theme song. Jitney, I reckon. Get us here tonight? You heard what he said. Well, that will be a surprise. In the history of this beloved television show, Irene Ryan was the first cast member to pass away. Donna Douglas, who portrayed Ellie Mae Clampett, was known for her dedication to fans, spending hours signing photos and replying to letters despite receiving a vast amount of fan mail. Interestingly, while her character was only 17 years old, Douglas was 30 at the start of the show and 38 by its conclusion. Dave, you never said you wouldn't go. Never said I wouldn't either. But that first you fella. In the heart of a classic television series, the bond between cast members often extends beyond the screen. This was evident in the relationship between Raymond Bailey and Nancy Culp. Bailey, who faced the challenges of Alzheimer's disease, found a loyal friend in Culp who continued to visit him, earning the affectionate nickname Slim. The show's conception can be traced back to a creative spark that ignited during Paul Henning's travels in the South. His vision of transporting a family from the rural past to the bustling present led to the creation of a memorable narrative set in Beverly Hills. Meanwhile, Buddy Ebsen, despite health concerns attributed to his earlier film work, remarkably outlived his fellow main cast members, leaving a lasting legacy as one of the last surviving links to the show's golden era. Some wolves keeping you awake too, Granny? Hey, sure ain't. I'll go right to you. In the world of classic television, few shows have a character ensemble as unique as this one. Among the memorable characters is Ellie Mae, known for her collection of animals. Interestingly, all her pets, except for cousin Bessie the chimpanzee, are male. This detail adds a layer of charm to her character's already distinctive personality. In the show's debut episode, viewers are introduced to a character simply known as the secretary portrayed by Nancy Culp. Her character would later become an integral part of the storyline. Behind the scenes, Max Bear Jr., who played Jethro Bodine, enjoyed the amenities of the Kirkaby Mansion, particularly the tennis courts during breaks from filming. These tidbits offer a glimpse into the off-screen life that parallel the on-screen antics. And they keep this fire going under this big boy. Officer Kelly. But imagine how long it would take City to boy. Switching from black and white to color, the show marked a significant transition on September 15, 1965, with the first color episode, setting a new visual standard until the end of its run in 1971. Over nine seasons, audiences enjoyed 274 episodes, with the initial 106 episodes in monochrome and the latter 168 embracing the vibrancy of color. In a different aspect of the show's history, Sharon Tate, born to Paul James Tate, and Doris Gwendolyn Willett, who married in 1942, later became associated with the series. Meanwhile, Nancy Culp's political aspirations in the 1980s saw an unexpected twist when her co-star Buddy Epson supported her rival in a public political advertisement. Self running off and leaving a child, that's it. <laughs> Three nights, six, she's singing. Before her role in the well-known sitcom, Joy Lansing had already worked with the legendary Orson Welles in two films, showcasing her range as an actress. Meanwhile, Lori Saunders, another cast member, was living a fulfilling life in Montecito, California by 1999, actively involved in charitable work alongside her family. Contrary to the on-screen age difference, Irene Ryan was indeed older than Donna Douglas, despite playful rumors suggesting otherwise. Their colleague Buddy Epson humorously addressed these rumors, highlighting the show's ability to blur the lines between reality and fiction for its audience. Congratulations for what? Well, I think you should be the person to know I'm elevating your husband to the board of directors. Board of directors? In the early days of Hollywood, Nancy Culp quickly made her mark by securing a film role shortly after arriving in the city. 
her talent was recognized swiftly, leading to a notable appearance in the model and the marriage broker. Buddy Epson, whose life and career are well documented, made significant contributions to the entertainment industry as detailed in the comprehensive Scribner Encyclopedia of American Lives. Meanwhile, Raymond Bailey was known for his versatility and character portrayal, often appearing without his toupee in various roles before becoming part of a beloved television ensemble. Hailing from the oil-rich hills of Bugtussle, Oklahoma, the Clampett family story is rooted in a place that's as real as the oil they struck. Their hometown, nestled northeast of McAlester near Lake Eufaula, is far from the mountainous regions often depicted in similar tales. In their circle, Sonny Drysdale stands out as a character whose background remains partially shrouded in mystery. Known only by his first name, Sonny's lineage ties him to Margaret Drysdale through her previous marriage, yet his full identity extends beyond what's shared on screen. The age difference between Louis Nye and Harriet E. McGibbon, who portrayed Sonny and his mother respectively, was a mere eight years of fact that adds another layer to their on-screen dynamic. Buddy Epson's journey to becoming Jed Clampett took a detour through the world of Disney, where he was initially considered for the role of Davy Crockett. Despite Walt Disney's initial interest, the role ultimately went to Fess Parker after his performance in them got Disney's attention. Epson, however, found his place as Crockett's companion, George Russell, a role that revitalized his career and paved the way for his later success as the beloved patriarch of the Clampett clan. This twist of fate highlights the unpredictable nature of the entertainment industry and the serendipitous paths actors often take to find their most memorable roles. Barefoot Galatea into a striking and sophisticated paragon of Beverly Hills in the heart of Los Angeles, the grand residence that served as the backdrop for the show's antics was not just a set, but a real mansion owned by the Kirkaby family, situated at 750 Belair Drive. A memorable moment occurs at the close of season one's credits, where Granny is seen giving a two-handed wave, a subtle yet endearing gesture. Linda Henning's journey to the screen began in childhood, with her participation in the Peter Pan Players acting group, which helped her conquer shyness through roles in classic tales. This experience paved the way for her casting as Betty Jo Bradley, after being spotted by B. Benaderet, who recommended her to the creator of Petticoat Junction for the role. Linda's transition from fairy tale stages to television screens was a testament to the power of nurturing talent from a young age. Dandy idea, especially if you got young ones. Elvia <laughs> Oman's personal life saw her marrying Wesley B. Tortolot, a musician, in 1930, but their union was brief and resulted in one child. Her second marriage was to Charles C. Seapile, a notable Illinois theater owner and sports agent, in 1937. Sadly, Pyle passed away from a heart attack two years into their marriage. In the show, Granny's roots are traced back to the hills of Tennessee, specifically Napoleon, Tennessee revealing a historical feud between her family, the Moses, and the Bodkins, which includes Mr. Drysdale's maternal lineage. Adding to the show's dynamic, Max Bear Jr. took on the roles of both Jethro and his twin sister, Jethreen Bodine, in the first season, with Jethreen's voice provided by Linda Henning, the daughter of the show's creator. This interplay of characters and backstories adds depth to the narrative, connecting the fictional family's histories with real-life inspirations. I wouldn't count on that, ma'am. Might be a good idea for you to leave the room. Who are you? In a unique touch of humor, viewers can spot Granny making a playful appearance between the rolling credits at the end of each episode. Frank Wilcox, known for his roles in several acclaimed films, graced the show with his presence. The Clampets, unfamiliar with the luxuries of their new home, amusingly mistook a pool table for a dining table, using its pockets to discard bones a testament to their simple, rustic ways. What does that stand for? Mr. Doctor, I reckon. <laughs> well, I'm an MD. Mrs. Doctor. In the mid-1960s, viewers in the Netherlands experienced a unique situation with a popular American show when the Dutch broadcaster NCRV aired what was announced as the final episode. However, due to the lack of internet, the audience could not confirm this information. It wasn't until the early 1970s that NCRV broadcast the previously unaired episodes, much to the surprise of the fans. Linda Henning lent her voice to the character of Jethreen, adding another layer of talent to the show's dynamic cast. 
Meanwhile, Buddy Ebsen, known for his leading role, shared more than just screen time with co-star Donna Douglas. Both were not only actors but also singers, and they shared similar political views aligning with the Republican Party. Their common interests extended beyond the set, reflecting a harmony that contributed to the show's success. And you hate her. Ellie Mae? Well, shucks, no. I'd cut off my right arm for her. In the show, the Clampets, a family from the hills, find themselves in a new world of wealth after discovering oil on their land. They bring along their loyal bloodhound Duke as they navigate their new life. Jed Clampett, portrayed by Buddy Epson, often finds himself pondering the decisions of his nephew Jethro, leading to his repeated resolve to have a serious conversation with him. This phrase became a recurring line throughout the series. Meanwhile, Sharon Tate, who appeared in a later film, was recognized by her co-stars for her acting skills and was seen as having a promising future in the industry. In the backdrop of a fictional bank in Beverly Hills, the narrative drew inspiration from a real-life institution in Kansas City, close to the show creator's hometown. At the age of 54, Buddy Epson brought life to the show, sharing his love for sailing with co-star Max Bear Jr., despite it not being a central theme of the series. Their off-screen camaraderie extended to sailing trips with James Arnaz, reflecting a bond that went beyond the cameras. In the mid-1960s, Sharon Tate was set to lead in Tarzan and the Valley of Gold. However, the role was later given to Nancy Kovac. Buddy Epson, known for his role in a popular sitcom, shared a special connection with co-star Donna Douglas, who felt he resembled her father, leading to many shared scenes. Meanwhile, B. Benadert was initially considered for the role of Granny, but ultimately portrayed cousin Pearl Bodine. You go next door to the Drysdales and smell some orange blossoms. I think they're getting ready for a wedding. Right. Donna Douglas, known for her role in a popular TV show of the early 1960s, shared a tradition with co-star Irene Ryan. They would host a grand Christmas celebration for the cast and crew every year. Beyond acting, Douglas also embraced a career in gospel music and thrived as a real estate agent in Beverly Hills. Meanwhile, Sharon Tate, another actress of the era, faced a casting change in The Cincinnati Kid. Initially chosen for the role of Christian Rudd, she was later replaced by Tuesday Weld. This decision came after the original director, Sam Peckinpah, was dismissed from the project and the producer disagreed with his creative choices, including shooting in black and white and including a scene with Tate unclothed. What did they pay you for? Well, he ain't paid me nothing yet. In the heart of Hollywood, Linda Henning was part of the California Artist Radio Theater, a group that found its home at the historic Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. Within the fictional world of a popular show, the characters revealed that Jethro was around 16 years old at the beginning, implying that his cousin Ellie Mae was about 14. The role of Granny, a pivotal character, was initially envisioned for B. Benadaret. However, to align the character closer to Mammy Yoakum from the Lil Abner comics, changes were made. Benadaret, not fitting this new vision due to her stature, recommended Irene Ryan for the role. Ryan's audition was so impressive that it not only secured her the part, but also became a memorable piece of the show's history preserved and shared as a special feature on the DVD collection. Won't be when we get to the mountains. You figure to keep that thing burning for us. In the early days of television, a show emerged that, despite its simple premise, captured the hearts of many. It featured a family from the countryside who stumbled upon wealth and moved to the city, embodying the classic fish out of water trope. The cast included Buddy Epson, who shared a deep connection with co-star Max Bear Jr., having known his father since the 1930s. Their bond was so strong that Epson became a father figure to Bear Jr. following his own father's passing. Irene Ryan, another member of the cast, transitioned to the stage after the show's conclusion, performing in a Broadway production. Her time on stage was cut short by a sudden health crisis, which led to her untimely death. Despite its popularity among viewers, the show faced criticism and was eventually discontinued in an industry shift towards urban-themed programming. This change aimed to attract a younger, more affluent audience, leading to the end of not just this show, but also other rural-themed series of the era. 
The shift marked a significant change in television history, paving the way for new shows that reflected the evolving tastes of the American public. Three and eight came in flowing 2,000 barrels a day. And it looks like the... In the landscape of television, certain performances and marketing effects stand out. Linda Henning and Cleveland Derrick share the unique distinction of being present in both the first and last episodes of Sliders, marking a consistent presence throughout the show's journey. Donna Douglas, known for her role in a classic series, significantly boosted the popularity of Blue Jeans, surpassing the influence of Cowboys over a century. Meanwhile, Max Bear Jr.'s unexpected casting as Jethro, due to his memorable smile despite missing the penultimate episodes, highlights the unpredictable nature of casting decisions and their lasting impact on a show's success. I reckon it's staring more at a horse. Kid, why don't you get one of them? In the early days of television, a show emerged that would become a staple of American culture. Among its notable figures was Richard Deacon, who spent his formative years in Binghampton, New York, sharing his hometown with Rod Serling, the mind behind the Twilight Zone. After graduating high school in 1938, Deacon would eventually find his way into the hearts of viewers across the nation. The show's concept proved so successful that it inspired similar series, such as Petticoat Junction and Green Acres, highlighting the trend of adapting successful formulas within the industry. Another prominent actor, Charles Lane, boasted a remarkable career with appearances in seven films nominated for the Academy Award for Best Picture, including the 1938 winner, You Can't Take It With You. His extensive filmography is a testament to the enduring appeal of classic cinema. Crazy in love with her. Oh, Granny, that was a long time ago before they moved to Nashville and become... In the landscape of early television, Phil Silvers left a mark with his portrayal of Master Sergeant Ernest G. Bilko, commemorated on a postage stamp decades later. The show known for its humor also cleverly integrated product placements within its opening credits, showcasing billboards for Kellogg's Corn Flakes and Winston Cigarettes, aligning with the era's advertising strategies. Meanwhile, Buddy Epson, before becoming a household name, honed his acting skills on stage in productions like Whoopi and The Male Animal, showcasing the breadth of experienced actors brought to the screen during television's golden age. In a subtle nod to a tragic event, a scene in Woodstock captures a glimpse of the era's atmosphere. A newsstand in the background displays headlines about Sharon Tate, reflecting the shockwaves her passing sent worldwide just days before the festival. The show known for its catchy theme song and endearing characters had a unique sign-off tradition. Donna Douglas, the actress behind Ellie Mae Clampett, would voice a warm farewell to viewers, promising a return on the same day and channel the following week. The infamous Silo Drive residence, once occupied by Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski, was replaced with a new mansion after its demolition. Despite the property's dark history and a significant price drop from its initial listing, it remains unoccupied, highlighting the challenges of selling a house with such a notorious past. All right, Ellie Mae, you fetch some firewood. Jethro, you slice them ham hogs. Before she became known to television audiences, Donna Douglas hailed from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and was known as Dot Bourgeois. Her beauty and charm won her the title of Miss Cinderella in 1955, along with a Caribbean cruise. Although she didn't clinch the Miss Louisiana title, she triumphed in several local beauty competitions and later served as a judge. Douglas's acting career began with a small part in the film Band of Angels, where she played a Southern Belle. The filming took place in her hometown and was extended from one day to a week due to the unpredictable Louisiana weather. A piece of television history, the 1921 Oldsmobile Model 46 truck, which became a symbol of the show, now resides at the Ralph Foster Museum at the College of the Ozarks. This truck, modified for the show, stands as a testament to the series' legacy. The show's popularity soared, dominating the Nielsen ratings as the top series for its first two seasons. It remained a top contender throughout its run, securing various spots within the top 20, with its sixth season reclaiming the number one position. The series' consistent performance over nine seasons reflects its significant place in television history. Gee, certainly have. Here they come now. Oh, get a load of those minks. Granny, Ellie Mae? In the landscape of television, connections between actors and their previous work often bring a unique flavor to their performances. 
B. Benaderet, known for her voice roles in the Flintstones and Top Cat, brought her animation experience to the live action setting. Buddy Ebsen, who played a central role, would sometimes reference historical figures from the silent film era like Francis X. Bushman, adding a touch of nostalgia. He even dropped the name of the legendary cowboy actor Tom Mix in the very first episode, creating a bridge between the old and the new. Charles Lane, another familiar face, was often seen in I Love Lucy in The Lucy Show, typically cast as the stern bureaucrat, a stark contrast to the comedic chaos surrounding him. These actors with their varied backgrounds contributed to the show's unique tapestry, blending past influences with contemporary humor. Your cousin and I were... Oh, no, no, we weren't. <laughs>